so you know about this popular cult and many others like it, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others who say, you know, we need to retool scripture. It's not clear enough in its own language. We need to somehow play with the Greek. We need to strap together different scriptures so that we actually uh, do eisegesis, which I abhor, which is when you come to the Bible and you grab a hold of these verses and you tie them behind uh, a man's back, so to speak, and you force that text to say what you want it to by how you have carefully taken, actually not taken, ripped, ripped words out of their contextual meaning and you fuse them together kind of like a two-headed freak <laughs> so to speak um that's evil and i think that there's major punishment coming for people that do that and <clears throat> i see a lot of people do that today i think it's very important that we do exegesis which is we come with big full ears to the feet of the prophets and the saints and the apostles before us, and we take each book in its full context, each paragraph, each sentence, and we treat it as if it is the most important thing on the face of the earth, and we are careful to not dissect its meaning from one book, from <laughs> one part of the Bible, that is topic specific to a very, well, I mean, what's another word for specific point and then try to latch that on and sew it together like Joseph Mangala with his twins to another scripture in the New Testament and present this freakish theory that was never in the heart and mind of the different authors that have together over 40 human authors through the Holy Spirit made one unified story in the Bible with lots of moving pieces. I think that's very dangerous. I think it's bad hermeneutics. I think it's completely falsifying the intent of the Bible when you do that. And that's, that, that is just a common no duh kind of thing that you see cults do. And so we were looking over here at the second Thessalonians and I like going into the Greek because while I love me some King James and some new King James and whatever in the English, it is a transliterate this warning from the apostle Paul about Jesus Christ who is uh in the first four feasts a very sweet little lamb isn't he he just puts his life out there for everybody and he has paid for the sins of the whole world and now each person that ball is in their court the holy spirit tirelessly works to convict the world of sin and oftentimes does not need a human uh, person to explain the gospel to people. Sometimes he works with people, but there's oftentimes people, they will come up with this idea that there are people off in the jungle and they never hear the name of Jesus. I remember Oprah uh, saying this. Uh, what then? And it's almost as if you tie God's hand behind his back, if that's something that you could even do in a metaphorical picture here, and say that if God doesn't have access to getting a human over to another human, that's it. You're going to hell for your sins. But actually, if you just listen to Acts 17, it talks about how, and let's let's go there too. Let's go there. It talks about how God is near and accessible. I don't remember what verse it is. Um, let me try to put it, but that's okay. Uh, so in him, that is God, we live and we move and we have our being. And the idea in this scripture, and I'll show it to you here, is that God is not far off and 
permanently divorced from any one of his creations. So that includes the people in the dark, deep jungles. Now, if you listen to testimonies, the ones that probably intrigue me the most are the ones where there's actually very little human interaction as uh, ambassador. And yes, God does use humans. I'm not saying he doesn't. But the ones that really intrigue me are the ones where the Holy Spirit just wallops somebody on the inside and shows them truth. And it's quite divorced from much human interplay. It is the creator working with his creation. And so that tells me that there is a faction of people out there that reject that, deny it, and run away from it. And we're culpable for that. And in one of the books of Acts, this is pretty interesting. I really like Paul's use of this intelligent taking the opportunity and walking through the door that presented itself over here on this Mars Hill. He says here, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription, so interesting, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. I mean, that's just brilliant. This is Paul for you. Always on the ball. God made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth and dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Not ultimately. Those were just a tool to get you to understand that he wants to be in your temple, in your body, which is what rebirth is. We have a whole bunch of videos on a playlist entitled Spiritual Damnation and the Cure of Rebirth. Really, really, really good, meaty, in-depth steak kind of stuff. I don't do milk stuff on this channel, uh, but I do try to make complex things simple so that people maybe who have not been exposed to the Bible or church life would be able to take it in and understand it very readily is where my heart is. I, I enjoy feeding the bride. Okay. Neither is worship with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And he, now look here, and he is made of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined, this is interesting, his sovereignty, the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Everybody is exactly where they're supposed to be in the world that he planned it out in the exact time that you're inhabiting, all within the sovereign hand of a very powerful God. That ye should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now wait, go back. Though he be not far from every one of us. So <clears throat> I wish I was there that day when Oprah talked about that. Because she said that there's people off in the dark, deep jungles of the earth. And they're going to go to hell because they don't know the name of Jesus. And there were two extremely iconic Christian women that were arguing with her, not arguing fight, fight, but arguing debate style, which I really honor. And I even remember their voices implanted in my heart to this day. This was many, many, many years ago and has been put on numerous YouTube channels, if you know what I'm talking about. And, and so they did a fairly good job of giving her answers, uh, I wish that this scripture right here would have come up. This is an important scripture to focus on because what it tells us is that God has an invitation standing for all people and that his spirit communes with his creation, irrespective of whether humans are available to assist or whether they know the name of Jesus. Now, we do get saved in Jesus. I'm not saying we don't, but I'm saying the Holy Spirit has a way of whether that's through visuals or through their language or whatever. I mean, figure it out. The, the, the spirit of the living God has a way to communicate with his creation to bring about the result that he wants. And God can do that however he chooses to. He's not limited that, oh, if we can't get a Christian out to this group 
Uh, although sometimes humans do go out that, oh, they're going to hell. That's it. God is not an unfair person. N not at all. And then it says here, for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets who have said, for we are also his offspring. So we're his creation for as much then as we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the Godhead, the God ruler is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. And at times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained. Who's that? Jesus. Wherefore he hath given assurance to all men in that he raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear again of this matter. That's funny. So they're hearing about the direction that God has given to conquer death and some of them mocked oh my goodness the level of man to refuse the truth and to suppress it in unrighteousness like romans 1 talks about it's just outrageous part of the suffering that will be incurred upon those who refuse to put their sons on jesus christ well he commanded them to do so and they refused by an act of their will to obey the gospel will be this penalty of suffering destruction. And this destruction, we talked about this before, it's ruin, doom, destruction, death, um, punishment. It, uh, there's a physical aspect to it, but there is a spiritual aspect to it. And it doesn't mean that you get out of hell uh, card and disappear. It doesn't mean that. And we talked about that in the previous video. But I want to look at this word suffer because you see so many of these cults saying, oh, you're not going to go suffer in hell. You burn up. Your body burns up. There is no soul. You don't need to worry about that. You get off the hook. All the evil that you refuse to put on Jesus. Guess what, Bubby? You got away with it. God's just going to circumvent his justice and you're going to get away with it. So if you did that bad thing to that child or you did this or you did that or whatever, all the sins that you ever did, my thought, word, and deed that Jesus compelled you to put on the cross and and let him pay for, guess what they'll tell you as a lie. In the end, you get away with it. No suffering. You just disappear and you go into non-existence, even though that scripture uh, is never, ever, and I mean ever, found in the Bible. In fact, what you actually have happening is God implementing his justice. Oh, you didn't want me to pay for your sins. Now you're going to. And it's not a bad thing for God to employ the use of suffering for evil. We're not talking about good people here. We're talking about evil that wanted to stay evil, to pay the penalty, strengthened for a primary TO to pay a price, a penalty. So yeah, there's a cost to your choice to ignore the, 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 the Bible. And it is eternal. It means from one age to the next age to the next and the next and the next, and the next, and guess what? You have an eternal loop from hell. That is hell. And you, you're kind of in a state of the living dead, in a sense. And look at this. The worst part is that you'll be away. Apo. Look at that. Apo. You'll be away from the presence of the Lord forever. You know why? Because you told him that that's what you wanted when you resisted him. So these big giant liars over here at UCG, United uh, Church and God, I think is what it is, beyond today with all their little flashy uh, colors and all this, are some tortured forever in the lake of fire. Any human being thrown in the lake of fire will be destroyed and will not be tormented for eternity. So that's where they start it. And uh, even though the Bible is absolutely crystal clear in Revelation 20 verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the false, where the beast and the false prophet are, are, not were, are, and shall be tormented, <laughs> tormented day and night forever. They have found a way to reclassify this that no, 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 it doesn't actually mean that. No, no, no. It just means their body was thrown into hell. And that burned up because of a passage that actually is talking about a bodily burning in Malachi that has nothing to do with the lake of fire. And then they go, well, maybe 
this Greek phrase translated forever and ever here, and then they give it, literally means unto the ages of ages. While that might mean for an eternity, it could also mean until the culmination of the ages, which would allow for an ending point soon after the casting into the fire. Even though the idea is that it's from one age to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, there is no ending. It's just on and on and 